Hello, everybody. Just to let you know that you have joined the Iraq Britain Business Council's AgriTech panel. Uh, we're just waiting for everybody to sign up and to log on. And then we'll start very soon. Okay, I think we probably will see people logging on very quickly. Oh, they're still going again. Here we go. Logging on. Okay, um, just to welcome you all, you have uh, joined the Iraq Britain Business Forum's uh, Council's uh, Agritech uh, panel. Uh, we're having that in two sessions today. Um, I'd like to very much welcome everybody, uh, particularly uh, members from the Iraq Agricultural Ministry. And we also know there's a strong presence from Baghdad University, uh, students and, and tutors, as well as Dohuk and Sulaimania. So welcome to you all. We hope you'll find this be very interesting indeed. Um, I'd like to just introduce a little bit about Iraq Britain Business Council for those of you that don't know us. Um, uh, we are uh, a member-driven organization, uh, and very much thanks to our members for allowing this to happen, to sponsor this, and to provide the funds for us to put on these events, which are hopefully for the benefit of everybody in Iraq, as well as uh, uh, internationally. Uh, we don't receive any government money, so it's, it's all member-funded, and we're very much open to uh, um, transparent and uh, best practice international standard businesses kind of benefits you would get from joining us. Uh, we have a very uh, reputable network of international and Iraqi businesses uh, who work transparently to best practice international standards. We often run trade missions to Iraq and to the UK, and we run regular conferences uh, with top speakers, often uh, in, in person, obviously today is uh, online. Uh, we like to share information and collaborate between our sectors and have holding sector tables with particular interest groups. Uh, we have access and relations with the, the government of Iraq and the UK government. We're also close to the UK EF, which is the uh, export finance group. And, um, we also provide a lot of know-how and information on Iraq and the region. So if you're interested in us, uh, please look at our website, iraqbritainbusiness.org, and uh, you're welcome to find out more about us. Today, uh, the event is really about how Iraq can modernize its agriculture, and we understand it is a priority for the current government of Iraq. And uh, we have a panel of fantastic experts, world-leading experts, in fact, on the subject. So we hope to showcase, explain, inspire, and encourage Iraq to accelerate its investment in agriculture technology. The session's going to be in two parts. Uh, the first part is uh, how we can understand the market, what's possible to achieve, and we'll be hearing from international NGOs, their intentions for Iraq, Iraqi agriculture and in Iraq, and also an exposition from what's possible technologically from Agritech, Epicenter, Rothamsted and British Water, who are world leading in their uh, institutions in terms of research. Uh, in the second half, we'll be looking much more about SMEs, uh, practical uh, applications, companies that have got wonderful things to offer, um, investors, and also from uh, the, the, the World Bank in terms of their insights uh, into what, what could be possible. So we'll be looking at some key questions today, um, you know, to understand what the current state of Iraq's farming community is and what the government of Iraq intends for the sector, what the UK and international organizations can offer Iraq in terms of agricultural technology, uh, wondering whether Iraq can leapfrog with technical, technological applications and what applications they might be. Uh, also to think about what the most practical use of farming technology is that Iraq can adopt, and what are the quick and the medium terms wins that it can take? What needs to happen to make these changes? And what are Iraqi startups and SMEs doing? And what support do they require? Uh, we'd like to look at insights into what the government of Iraq is doing and intends to deliver and also to reach out to any private sector landlords who might want to collaborate with new technologies and companies develop their land. We'd also pose the question, how can you also develop agriculture on salty lands and how can you rehabilitate these kinds of soils? 
so without more ado, uh, I'd like to welcome my first uh, panel member, who is Porika Hanley, who is the owner and MD of Iraq Business News. And for those of you that don't know, he has an extensive network of business people in Iraq that he feeds with the latest information. Fantastic publication. Uh, if you need to get to the audience in Iraq, he's the man to go to. Um, so, Porik, could I pass over to you to give an overview from your point of view uh, for agriculture in Iraq? Thank you. Uh, certainly. Th th thank you very much, Ashley. Um, you know, I always think it's it's funny and and sometimes obviously a bit a bit sad when people in in Europe and the U.S. think of Iraq, and they tend to think of sand and desert, and it completely slips their minds that this is the same Mesopotamia that we all learned about in school. You know, that the land between the two great rivers, part of the Fertile Crescent, where one of the places where modern civilization began with the start of agriculture. So if we look at present-day Iraq, actually about something like 22% of Iraq is land that would be suitable for agriculture, and about half of that is, is actually used. And about 20% of the workforce are employed in agricultural work, which makes it very surprising then that for, for a variety of reasons, Iraq often cannot feed its, itself and has to import food. Now, just to be clear, I have no problem in principle with a country importing food or anything else. And I, I don't regard self-sufficiency as some sort of ideal to be aimed for. But at the same time, you have to build on the competitive advantages that you have as a country. And Iraq doesn't just have fertile land. It also has, very unusually, all the natural resources needed to make all the fertilizers it could want. So all the, all the building blocks are there, but you know, clearly we need to become more efficient in how we use them and in the, the production and the distribution of food. And I think that's where the tech part of this, this agri-tech comes in. So we need to find clever and innovative ways to be more productive and to, to put less in and to get more out, whether it's in terms of water usage or fertilizers or land area or labor hours or whatever. And, and that's vital not just from an economic point of view, but also from an environmental point of view. And technology, I believe, can, can help us to achieve that. Now, sadly, the, the government's recent white paper makes no mention of this. There, there's one reference, I believe, to, to modern irrigation techniques, and that's it. And then it falls back again on this need to strictly enforce border controls to prevent imports from competing. And I, I know why politicians feel that they need to do this, but it's a policy that ultimately leads to Iraqi consumers and taxpayers paying more and getting less and getting poorer quality produce. In other words, it's a policy that makes people poorer than they would be if they were allowed to spend their money as they wish. And I would suggest that politicians and civil servants need to understand that companies and businesses don't have an automatic right to people's money just because they happen to be on this side of the border. So I, I know Ashley and Agni have put together a fantastic lineup of speakers here today, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing about new initiatives and, and new thinking to make agriculture in Iraq more competitive and, and more productive and kinder to the environment, and ultimately to, to help Iraq regain its place as, as a major food producer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. That figure of 50% of the land is un cultivated or the potential of it is a phenomenal thought to bear in mind. Eric, I'd like to call now on Eric Bouchot, who is head of mission, uh, head of programs in Iraq for ITC, uh, the International Trade Center, which is the joint technical agency of the United Nations and the World Trade Organization uh, among the UN ecosystem. ITC is the only development agency that is fully dedicated to supporting the development and internationalization of small and medium-sized enterprises. So he's a head of mission or Head of Programs in Iraq for ITC. Eric, over to you, looking forward to this, thank you. Thank you, thanks a lot, Ashley, uh, and thanks to IPVC for organizing this uh, this event and, and for reaching out to, to ITC, and, and likewise, uh, thank you to, to Capita for, for the connection. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Indeed, uh, ITC, the International Trade Center, is the uh, technical agency of the UN and uh, of the WTO. Uh, we've been in Iraq uh, for only uh, a year now, so, so fair, fairly new. Uh, we are HQ'd in, in Geneva with, uh, with many offices 
and projects around the world, uh, and we've been operating in the regions uh, for the last uh, three decades, uh, with particular focus on in and, and post conflict zones. So ITC is fairly well known for for its ground operations and, and threat related technical assistance that are in most cases I would say characterized by um, buyer led investor led market led approaches. So although we do focus on economic operators along the value chains from the farmers and, and the firms. We also, in each of our projects, embed a trade policy uh, angle, as well as an uh, institutional strengthening dimensions. And that's the case uh, of the projects that I, I will be touching on today, a project that is uh, financed, sponsored by the uh, European Union for about 23 uh, million euros over, over five years, and that particularly focuses on agriculture and agribusiness development. And that's so through the strengthening of farmers and firms' productive capacity as well as competitiveness. So agri-tech will definitely play a role there. But also we'll be looking at strengthening the capacities of a few selected agencies, organizations throughout the value chains that are due to, to play an important role uh, in terms of uh, training, education, quality management, trade facilitations, advocacy, and so on. And likewise, like I said, we have a trade policy component which focus on supporting uh, the government in its accessions to the World Trade Organizations. So the accessions may not be reached through the lifetime of, of these projects, but we'll be using it as a vehicle to push some of the well needed reforms uh, that are a part of it actually uh, of the, the government's white paper. So the name of the projects, just for your information, and if you want to look for it, it's threatening the agriculture and agri-food value chain and improving trade policy in Iraq. Uh, the acronym is SAVI, you see the calligraphy uh, behind me, and it's part of a larger financial package on special measures towards job creation that the EU has put together and that FAO, IOM, ILO, GIZ is, is contributing to. It's always obviously being done under the leadership of the Ministry of uh, Planning, Ministry of Agriculture and Ministry of Trade. So now, just for the focus of, of this session, uh, just to let you know that we're currently finalizing the inception phase. So we've done a lot of competitiveness surveys on farmers, on SMEX, market studies, consumer survey, store checks, interviews, uh, interviews of outlet owners, focus group discussions with farmers. And there are many issues, like Ashley mentioned, in terms of capacity, capital availability, supply chain management, access to proper inputs. The cost of inputs are huge. The access to markets, access to finance, and of course, a number of institutional shortfalls that you all know uh, about. But there are also some specifics to Iraq that makes the situations uh, even more complex and for which agri-tech initiatives are even more precious and, and needed. And that has to do with the fact that, let's be honest, the private sector is at a fairly embryonic stage. We have a, a distorted mindset as well because we're talking about a rent economy because of the subsidies, because today, IELO actually just published uh, a, a recent study, 43% of households rely on government's jobs and pensions. And we have a fairly informal sector as well. So most of the companies are not registered. So they are hard to reach out to and to capacitate as well. So, and uh, needless to say as well that we have very little sector organizations, associations, aggregations of actors. So those are key issues all together with a solid and strong presence of market forces that exercise control of our uh, demand. And let's bear in mind again that Iraqi annual as, uh, household, for instance, consumptions equal the one of Ireland, Singapore. It, it keeps on fluctuating, but I think it's close to $150 billion. So that's a financial windfall that some want to keep their hands on, okay? But they are encouraging signs indeed because the government now is really seizing the occasions of you know, making sure that we approach food distribution system in a better way, in a more strategic way, that we reduce this massive import bill, that we focus on diversifications and so on and so forth. So for us, and that's why we, we are very delighted to be part of, um, of this session, we're looking at agri-tech from various angles, whether it's in terms of bottom part of the value chains, productivity, wastage, water and, and crop management, whether we're talking about drip irrigation system, water retention techniques, remote sensing, soil testing, disease detections, and so on and so forth. But also at uh, technology and, and even business ideas to facilitate collective initiatives, whether it's to build further commercial ties, alliances among the, the actors, or whether it's in terms of, of knowledge management, access to prices, access to 
to informations about seeds variety, smarter way of procuring the, the inputs, and so on and so forth. So, but also obviously, you know, marketing platforms, uh, farm to business or other sort of, of uh, agri, uh, agri ventures, but also access to, you know, access equipments and so on and so forth. So our project as well, and I will end with this as a strong component on youth entrepreneurship. Uh, my colleague, David Cordobes, who is actually scheduled to touch on this later on, uh, and I will, for instance, and we've been already to Mosul and we'll be going to Mosul in four weeks, meeting and interacting with the College of Agriculture, among others, to assess what are the leading edge technology or perhaps even more standard techniques that could be adapted, but also, you know, what activities and incentives, business opportunities are required to, en uh, to engage youth in the agricultural sectors and best strengthen their business skills. Because when we're talking about agri-tech, we cannot go uh, you know, without, without the use. So that's just to say that you know, there is a large spectrum of options which are being considered when it comes to agri-tech in Iraq. But the bottom line for UN organizations like ours, with a project like ours, again, sponsored by the EU, it's to ensure that we also remain realistic that we basically go with, with what is practical and what is applicable to Iraq uh, that, are, that, is, that currently has a very traditional form of agriculture. But to be innovative enough uh, that this generate the boost and the momentum that is needed to basically revive the trust and the confidence and the pride among, among the actors. And if we manage to do it gradually and progressively enough, then we need to embark some local institutions and agencies and NGOs as well that could be associ associated you know, through some capacity building package. And likewise, again, we, 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 you know, we find this tripartite uh, approach that we manage via trade policy and trade facilitation work to push and promote some essential reforms that aims uh, to render the current business environment more conducive uh, than it is now. So from this event, what we'd like in indeed to engage into a bit of a brainstorming on the, the few technologies and techniques that are most suitable for, for Iraq and that can also contribute to further build, you know, their, I would say their resilience towards the various shocks and, and challenges that, that Iraq is being faced with. Thanks a lot. Eric, thank you very much. Just a couple of things. Obviously, the idea of creating a very large ecosystem of different uh, players is important. Uh, where, where would you sort of focus first out of interest? Is there a starting point here? Is it the ground up or is it the, the, the institutions or where, where have you got a view as to the first, first steps? Well, th th that's a bit of the issue. When I say that usually, you know, usually the way we intervene and we build those commercial ties and those commercial alliance, we often rely on key market operators as well as uh, sector associations. You know, uh, in the particular case of Iraq, there is no, no such uh, sector uh, association that really plays the role that, that usually, uh, you know, co-ops could, could, could play. For the market actors, we've been talking to uh, world sales agents, market operators, even Carrefour in Erbil as well, to basically understand best the requirements as well that they have and how it could basically, you know, increase, uh, you know, the local productions, uh, you know, to serve their, their needs. But we will be also working with the inputs providers, the, the, the stores that sells the seeds today are major actors when it comes to leading, training, doing the soil testing that, that is being done uh, in Iraq. So I would say it's not one particular uh, segment of the value chain, but that's, uh, you know, managing to, to create uh, those, those linkages that, uh, that are, you know, somewhat very, somewhat very limited in Iraq. Thank you. And the other thing, I'm noticing people are wanting to get in touch with people already, which is a very good sign. And on the one hand, you can come through IBBC, we can introduce you to the panelists. On the other, there is a chat function there, you can leave your email and, and maybe just leave a message for someone. So there's a double option there. I'm very happy to follow that up. And Eric, for example, are you happy to receive people coming to you directly or uh, happy to intermediate it, whatever's simpler? Yeah, no, feel free to, uh, to communicate or, or contact details, of course. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, now we're moving on to uh, Timothy Robertson, who is Senior Agriculture Specialist for the World Bank. And he's been working very much in the agri-food sector in Iraq for the past few years and in the region. So, uh, Timothy, looking forward to hearing what the World Bank's got up its sleeve. <laughs> okay, thanks Ashley. So uh, I'm gonna slightly repeat what other people have been saying, um, but um, hopefully also touch on some new points. Um, 
the first the first thing I'd say is you know, we're, we're operating in a post-conflict environment. Uh, decades of conflict have really influenced the policy uh, uh, and institutional environment very, very heavily. And one of the key um, ways that that influence is manifest is in the short-termism that is both uh, reflected in the, in the politics, but also the vision uh, of the future. And I think this is particularly uh, important in terms of the agri-food system in Iraq. Um, restoring the natural resource base is a time, uh, requires time. Uh, addressing the issues of soil quality, salinity improvements, access to quality of water, uh, this, this takes time. Um, the infrastructure has been deeply uh, and negatively impacted by decades of conflict. And that's particularly true of the irrigation system, which has been uh, very profoundly affected. Uh, and the investment in uh, human and social capital, one of the, the, the consequences of, of war, one of the terrible consequences of war is that people lose trust in, in institutions, they lose trust in each other. There's a de-investment in, in knowledge and innovation and technology. Um, and all of this is deeply impactful for the future of the, of the, of the sector. And as was previously, uh, Patrick was mentioning, you know, Iraq's history in, in agricultural, uh, in the agricultural sector uh, was largely based upon research and the ability to, to invest in research. And that has been deeply undermined by the short-termism uh, of the current uh, way of thinking. Uh, and, and I think, uh, the final thing I say around the post-conflict environment is that it's the social contract and uh, the importance of food to the social contract. Anybody who has spent any time in Iraq and in the region knows very clearly that uh, if you don't have access to affordable food, uh, the social contract breaks down very, very quickly. And so this highlights the importance of the food system uh, for Iraq. And uh, I think the opportunities are really significant. Um, you know, there's political will to talk about the food system, and I don't think that's been there for, for, for quite some time. And people are recognizing that, that the public cost of the current food system is extremely high. Oil is going to run out uh, within the next decade. And somehow uh, Iraq's food system needs to become more fit for purpose. It has a huge opportunity to create employment and to maximize the considerable potential of Iraq's youth endowment. Um, there is already, already examples that, that we see of um, private sector investment and actually getting into the agricultural sector. That there's opportunities, uh, as um, were highlighted about the, Eric was highlighting the informal, informality of the sector. Well, the informality is a, is a long-term challenge, but it's also a short-term opportunity. Getting into the sector for private sector investment is relatively easy. Um, one of the challenges, but also one of the opportunities has been that Iraq has missed out, I think, on, on many of the, the, the creative forces that digital technology can, can bring. This is particularly true in, in accessing finance. Iraq's financial sector is deeply ingrained in some, in some very traditional structures, but the digital economy and the way that digital economy works uh, creates uh, significant opportunities, not only for employment, but enabling uh, uh, investors to think about uh, farming and farming risk in entirely different ways. And there are lots of examples in the world that uh, where this has been achieved in, in Iraq, I think, is ripe for this. And the final thing I, I'd say about the opportunities is that Iraq's population is growing uh, rapidly. The demand for food is, is only going to increase. The demand for better quality food is only going to increase. The scourges of, of in food, in food insecurity and, and poor diet. Um, are already prevalent in Iraq, but challenging those uh, represents a significant market opportunity um, and an opportunity to create jobs and employment. And let me then just transition to, to what we as the World Bank are doing. Uh, we currently have a, a $30 million investment in, into agricultural uh, infrastructure and um, supporting the reconstruction of, investment, of infrastructure in those areas particularly uh, affected by the conflict. We are um, embarking upon um, uh, processes to try and strengthen the, the policy dialogue and the, and the capacity for policy dialogue around the agri-food sector. We're also looking for models uh, that can allow inclusive agricultural growth in particular. Um, and I think again, as Eric pointed out, how do we aggregate uh, large numbers of small farmers together so that they become 
become more efficient and more effective? How do we ensure that um, the youth endowment of, of Iraq is effectively engaged? And how do we ensure that the very large numbers of women who are involved in the sector uh, do so in, in a more productive, uh, less informal, more effective manner? And the, and the, the final point it, uh, I would raise in terms of where we're heading in terms of investment is, is around technology, uh, as I mentioned, particularly digital technology, but also the, um, the rising impact of climate smart, um, climate uh, change on Iraq and, and really very, very happy investment into climate smart technologies, not only on farm level, but how can we use climate smart technologies to improve processing, make processing more competitive, how can we use climate smart uh, technologies to reduce energy consumption, etc.? And we we currently have um, a, proposed, a, a concept node that's looking at a hundred million dollar investment, and that's that's we view that as the start. And we're just uh, working with the government to try and uh, improve the, the lending environment so that we can make that uh, that, uh, that loan go forward. And thanks. Uh, Timothy, thank you very much. Just to quiz you on that a bit, uh, the, uh, you've really got $30 million in there. You've got another $100 million coming. Uh, we've got you know, $23 million coming from the EU. There's quite a lot of money coming in this sector. Where do you see it directly going first? What's most practical? And um, can, how can do they have to go through the government of Iraq to, to engage with this, or, or, or can private players play with you? How, how can that work? Um, so through the... Um... Where is this, where is, let me try and break down those questions. So that there are opportunities. We see opportunities in specific value chains, um, tomato value chain, chickens, poultry, uh, are a couple of examples. Um, and um, our analysis shows that uh, those, those value chains are, are those where there's perhaps least less direct government uh, engagement. Um, and those are the areas where there's, there's clear opportunity. Now working with us, um, uh, we need to, uh, the government is our client, yes, but we have various mechanisms of working uh, with the private sector and with, uh, with associations, matching grants, etc. cetera. Um, so there's, there are opportunities for us to engage with private sector. That is, that is I think, uh, especially in the context of Iraq where their fiscal uh, uh, crunch is really on, um, we see the private sector and we look for ways to engage with private sector as the driving force of, of reform and transformation of the sector. Thank you, Tim. Uh, obviously, IBBC is a private sector organisation, so uh, we do look at things in, in that way, and it's very heartening to hear that. And uh, chicken and tomato sounds good to me anyway, which is great. Um, now, I'd like to turn to uh, more practitioners now and some of the innovative things that are happening. Um, I'm delighted to in introduce Shamal Mohammed, uh, who's Chief Technical Officer at the Agri Epicenter, which is one of the UK's four centres for agri technology. Um, and he looks at engaging farmers with technology and providers to provide upscale digital products and services to improve production systems, and environmental uh, and sustainability. So Shamal, really looking forward to what's on offer. Thank you very much, Ashley. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Ahlan wa sahlan bikum bihail mu'tamar al-kareem u bakhir bin satshaw bo am konferansa. I'm trying to kind of uh, welcome everyone in three different languages, uh, Ashley, just for, for information. So my Very name good. is Thank Shamal. You. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm Shamal Mohammed. I'm a chief technical officer at AgriB Center. Uh, just kind of following from what Timothy was saying in terms of the, the challenges specifically for agriculture in Iraq, I tried to kind of put in a pro prospect of the, the global challenges as well as the industry's sort of uh, challenges facing, you know, everyone uh, globally. It's, it's a climate change and the, the fast growing population. Obviously, we need to increase uh, and, and produce sufficient food. But that's, we have only two options. Either we expand uh, our agriculture farmland or we intensify the, the activities, but unfortunately, both of them, they have a, a, a negative impact on, on natural capital and the natural resources. So if you, you know, agriculture intensification, you have a problem with the soil degradation, soil contamination, greenhouse gas emission, which is negatively will impact on, on a climate change. But also if you add in more land into a farmland might cause a biodiversity losses and deforestation. In the same time, we need to think about how we can capture more carbons in the soil to mitigate climate change. So we, we kind of in a dilemma here and we're trying to kind of uh, 
answering all these challenges globally. And I think agriculture in Iraq is facing the same sort of challenges as well. But more specifically in the Middle East, in my view, there is a three different areas where uh, it's a quite a, a problematic in terms of food security. Uh, water availability, the quality and quantity is, is a biggest issue, uh, as well as the soil and also the dependency on an imported food. So we're trying to kind of look at these challenges in order to utilize and the capabilities the technology can provide in order to help farmers and the industry to make better decision. So what I would like here to do is, is basically just to give you a flavor of the technology currently we testing and trialing, but also some of the technology I'm demonstrating is a commercial product. So it's already been tested, which helped quite a lot. So yield mapping, yield monitoring is, is a, a, has been around for a, a couple of decades or maybe more, which is a very important piece of technology can help the harvesters mapping the productivity within the field so we can understand the variability in terms of productivity, understanding the limiting factor, why this part of the field, for example, in this case, the brown bit is always below the average in terms of productivity, while the, the yellow, uh, the, the blue one is always above the average. So that would help farmers to understand what actually is going on in the soil so they can go and, and mitigate these problems. So in, in talking about soil uh, variation and, and understanding the soil variation is, is really important. There are multiple ways we can do that here in the UK and also uh, in the EU as well. So we can use the soil brightness from air observation. There are technologies like uh, electroconductivity. We can measure uh, these variability and, and, and soil analysis is crucially important for understanding this variability and helping farmers to improve productivity and minimize the environmental impact. The other technology has been around for a couple of decades is an auto steering system and automation of some of the, uh, you know, the tractors operation and, and a use of GPS system and RTK. And that will save time, but also it would save the input application as well because the GPS and the technology can drive the tractor in a straight line and come back in a straight line. So you avoiding any overlap in terms of your fertilizer application or even in terms of your cultivation. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of discussion around driveless car uh, in the last uh, few years, but actually farmers in the UK and in Europe has been using this auto steering system for uh, many, many years and has a huge uh, benefit in terms of improving the efficiency of the farm operations. Talking about the data and how we can capture the farm data, obviously there are multiple ways using satellite imageries, using sensor technologies, using drones and all of that systems and, and applications. We can almost create a, a different layer of information for each uh, uh, aspect of the field, and that would help us to understand some of this variability and some of this limitation on the field scale. And, and some of these data sources actually is free of charge, like satellite data. It just need a, a proper processing and analysis to help farmers and the businesses. Drones, I mentioned, we done some project looking at the grass uh, biomass uh, estimation, and that's hugely important for livestock sector, but equally important for the uh, arable sector as well for predicting yield and predicted productivity. Uh, automation, another technology, uh, obviously in the livestock sector has been around for many years now. So like a, a robotic milking machine, we have a, a, a farm in the UK. Uh, we have a three robotic milking machine and works very well and help farmers improving their inputs as well as the output of the system. But also we see a lot of uh, uh, new development in, in robotic systems in, in arable and a crop sector that can help you know, detecting disease at early stages and, and obviously applying inputs and fertilizer and agrochemicals. So what I'm trying to say here is agriculture is a very data rich industry and we can collect a lot of information. And then obviously in the last few decades, the, the storage of the data is getting much cheaper. We have much more power of analytics so we can understand some of these challenges and variabilities and helping farmers make better decisions to improve productivity, but also improve environmental sustainability. So there are different ways that technology can help, for example, in reducing waste and improving efficiency, as I mentioned, but also looking at the crop production system and its resilience, understanding the true cost of the food, 
diversifying the system. There are a lot of new ideas how we can use the mixed farm, for example. Uh, so there are different ways the technology can help the industry in Iraq. What I would like to do very briefly, it's just an introduction about agri P center. So we are one of the four agri-tech centers in the UK, funded by Innovate UK, which is the, an agency from the government. And our role is to bridge between science and technology and the industry. We're trying to translate some of this advancement in technology and science into a practical solutions for farmers. So we work with 24, five, uh, 24 farmers across the UK. We have a different location in a blue uh, point so you can see on the map. And our idea is to maximize the adoption and uh, integration of technology in the farm businesses. Uh, I mentioned our dairy development center is a commercial dairy farm, 180 cows. It's a heavily automated system. So we have a feeding uh, autom automated feeding machine. We have a, a robotic milking machine and, and actually it made a huge improvement in the farm productivity and sustainability. We also have a large glass house uh, for phenotyping, developing new varieties. For example, in case of Iraq, how we can develop a variety of wheat or barley that can resist the drought and lack of water and using the water more efficiently, but also looking at the post-harvest, how we can store the crop uh, and the fresh produce for longer. And I think that's quite important in order for farmers to get a return on their investment. We also have a various different sort of technologies uh, from soil to crop to livestock. But more importantly, what I would like to emphasize for a couple of minutes, our international smart farm. So we have a, a few international smart farm uh, initiative, one in China. So we work with our Chinese partners building a demonstration farm, how to smart, bring in the smart technologies into a Chinese agriculture setting, helping them to make better decisions using some of the sensors. And we've been working with them for a couple of years now. We also worked in, in New Zealand, looking at the big data in beef sector and dairy sector. We also have a demonstration farm in Paraguay. And, and that's, I think, this is really important sort of ways of building a collaboration and understanding the challenges facing those countries and also bringing some of the capabilities from the UK agri-tech sector to help support in those countries. So in my view, what I see as a, as a potential for a collaboration between Iraq and the UK, digital soil mapping is really, really important because soil is a building block of the, any farming system. So we need to understand that we need to understand the limitation and the possibilities, what we can do, but also looking at a variety and breeding, especially around drought tolerance and maximizing water use efficiency, post-harvest storage, hugely important, training, education, and collaboration in research and building that sort of a in-house capability. Uh, there was already a mention about the farmers cooperative, a, a public private partnership uh, sorry, there is a typo there, uh, but that's to enable the, the, the engagement of the farmers with, a, with the private sector as well as the public sector to bring some of these technologies and demonstrate. And, and I will stop with the last point about the Smart Farm Initiative for Iraq and UK. I think that would be a great uh, opportunity for developing as well as demonstrating some of the value chain, so some of the values of these technologies in, in agriculture in Iraq. So I'll stop here and I'm happy to take any question later on. Thank you so much. Thanks, actually. Shamal, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Um, just a quick question for me is that um, if you're using digital technologies and satellite technologies, presumably you need strong relations with, for example, telecom companies uh, to, to help deliver this. Is Iraq ready for that? I mean, can it do that? Well, I mean, in terms of the uh, satellite data you know because most of these platform they are a global platform so you can access some of this data regardless but i think your point around connectivity is hugely important so some of this technology need a, a connections on a farm level and and we we even in the uk we have this problem of connectivity and this is why we done a couple of projects with cisco looking at the application of 5g uh, technology, for example, but you're absolutely right. But there are ways we can get around it. There are companies like Imrasat, they provide connectivity using the satellite itself. And, and the second thought about uh, doing a smart farm in Iraq, um, your partners might be, for example, a university, someone like the University of Baghdad, potentially a private sector, or, or, or what, who, would, who would be the collaborators on that? 
Yes, well, I think East is going to be both. I think it is going to be the uh, university, the academic partners, as well as the commercial partners, because, it, it, you know, for this technology to provide and then demonstrate the value, we need a commercial farm to enable us to, to, to engage and, and understand and deploy some of this technology. So answering your question, yes, it would be fantastic if we can get a university as well as maybe a group of farmers uh, as, as a demonstration. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm sure Thank there will be lots of things to follow up on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'd very much like to come to Nicola Yates now, uh, who is the International Programs Manager at Roth Hampstead Research and leads the international office. Hello, Nicola. Can we hear you? Can't hear you at the moment. Just waiting for Nicola Yates to come on. Hello, Nicola. Okay, not sure she's... Uh, no, I, I'm here now. Hello, Nicola. Uh, the, Sorry the about that. Yes, uh, we've had a terrific one from uh, Agri Epicenter, and I'm pretty sure we're going to have an exciting one from you too. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hi. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank IBBC for organising this event and for inviting me to join such a prestigious panel. I'm excited to understand the opportunities that may arise from events such as this, and I look forward to developing future strategies and concepts with you all uh, for future engagement. I have to stop Pac-Man there, I'm afraid. <laughs> right, so um, I'd like to give you a very brief introduction of Rothamsted Research and try and outline where I believe Rothamsted can support our colleagues. Um, so what is, what is Rothamsted Research? Rothamsted is the longest running agricultural institute in the world and was established in 1843. We have an annual budget of around 35 million and around 350 employees, including 180 researchers, students and techni technicians that completely specialise in agricultural research. We have two uh, research and development campuses in the UK. Uh, one is in Harpenden, just north of London, and one is in the southwest of the country in Devon which focuses on livestock production systems. Our research centres uh, around several research areas in, and includes our international renowned scientists and innovators. Breeding, uh, inter, uh, innovative uh, plant science groups, which screen, develop and design key plant traits and markers for crop breeding. Its aim is to develop plant breeders toolkits for improving crop production and quality and expanding the use of plants for industrial purposes and building climate resilient crops. This focuses on stable staple crops such as wheat, barley, maize, oil seeds and rice, but also incorporates work on novel crops such as sorghum and millet. We have our smart crop and livestock protection teams that are not only focus on protecting the crop and livestock as they grow, but also focus on ensuring the quality of the product after it's been harvested and a bit of post-harvest storage, as uh, Shamal was talking about, which I believe, as, as same as he does, it was going to be vitally important in the early chain, early value chain development. Understanding the whole agricultural systems are a high priority for Rothamsted, and we always ensure that aspects of the system are considered when improving agricultural production. We develop and test innovative systems that, that increase food production, but also reduce the environmental footprint and are sustainable. In our Southwest campus, we are developing integrated livestock farming systems that are climate smart with specialist units, which includes state-of-the-art instrumentation dedicated to assess efficiency and environmental impact of livestock production. We have a large group of specialist business developers that support our research to deliver global impacts from their innovative research. We have re research, uh, we have teams dedicated to global partnership development, grant funding and knowledge exchange, which provides state of the art training and know how to farmers and help build academic research capacity in middle and lower income countries. Rothamsted Research is a part of a much larger on-site agritech business centre, which houses agritech businesses which work nationally and internationally. And these businesses work along outside our innovation and commercialization teams. 
to help Rothamps to deliver commercial and marketable products from our science. science. Rothamps Enterprise also hosts one of three of the Innovation UK centres mentioned, centres of excellence mentioned earlier, and our unique research led seed investment programmes led by Rothamps Research are also on site, such as SHAPE and AGRIA and the Impact Lab. So, how can this research uh, support agricultural security and resilience uh, in Interact to build that? I believe this goal needs to be tackled with different timescales working alongside all the agricultural players. So firstly, we have uh, kind of evaluating the current state. This isn't just us going in and evaluating what's there, but it's working with Iraqi colleagues. Rothamsi can support the evaluation of current policies and strategies by providing some more additional evidence mapping, agricultural metrics, monitoring the current state, and quantitatively evaluating implementing, uh, uh, implemented mechanisms. Working with farmers and stakeholders, we strongly believe in that. We work in the country, we work with the players in that country. We can develop resource maps, we can model climate predictions and ensure that strategies are in place and will work for future generations. Secondly, we want to have immediate actions. I'm a, I'm a researcher by training, but I certainly don't want to do three, four years of research before anything happens, it, it, you know, what we can provide to Iraq. So we want to triage immediate actions and build on the excellent work that's already been carried out there. And we want to advise and support immediate solutions, ensuring that appropriate technology is proposed, appropriate technology on our, behalf, on our side. I think that's really key that is suited for all and the correct training is provided to use this technology. We can support the delivery of innovation and implementation of innovations that benefit the whole agricultural system, such as advanced soil mapping, again, we kind of copying from more, more on from what Shamal is doing, biotechnology advanced crops, smart crop and livestock protection, studying and modeling farmer behavior and how we implement these demonstrate and demonstrate these technologies. We find that is really key um, for when going into countries and working with countries as the farmers will be doing work and they are key to, central to all of this. Rothamsey does a long successful history of working with international partners in collaborative research pro projects to develop bespoke innovations for in country based challenges. We want to, this is the bit that I think I, I'm really strongly, um, uh, uh, I feel, have a lot of feeling about this, is we want to safeguard agricultural development and ensure that Iraq is resilient against any further climate or agricultural challenges. We want to build research capacity in the country, working with those, those fantastic scientists that are already there and developing and nurturing the talent of enthusiastic young researchers through exchanges and collaborative programme development with Rock Rothamsted and Agri um, Iraq's top universities. So we can ensure the country's food security and growth for, for the future and to, to, to gain a partner in global agricultural research. Just moving on um, uh, quickly to our African soil information surface that was developed with a Bill and Melinda Gates um, project many years ago. And this was a, a, across Africa, and this is pub, making publicly available soil nutrient maps with a resolution of 30 meters, which is quite amazing. Um, using low cost technologies to generate high value soil information for farmers, for stakeholders, for researchers as well. This is based on new low, co low cost rapid methods for dry spectral analysis. It's high throughput, it's fast. Rothamsted has a reference lab for wet and dry soil analytics for existing and new projects. And we can work together with Iraq on this. We want uh, dry spectral ana analysis is carried out in the soil, soil but then it's also, um, we can use this to look at plant and fertilizer and, and how, how, how else we can treat that and develop uh, farm platforms and, and advisory units based on people's soil um, structure. Just a very brief overview. I mean, we have got a lot of innovations, but I just wanted to bring up four that could already be kind of as the quick wins that could go into Iraq straight away. We have methods for forecasting crop pests. This will minimize any 
crop protection um, inputs uh, later on because we can tell you when when is this crop, uh, this pest going to appear do we need to do something about it we do smarter management of livestock pests with our chemical ecologies they're developing pest traps so this is building on kind of like not just sprays pesticides but this is trapping and luring and almost repel, uh, pest repellents like we can see in this cow here and, sh and, and we have sugar rocks which is a novel crop uh, stimulant that can increase crop yield by 20 percent um base it's very good of resilience it helps um increase plants resilience to drought and um, flood and it's used for several key crops mainly in wheat at the moment but it is also being moved on to other crops and phosphorus, which is a really simple in field for, uh, phosphorus availability soil kit which seems you know it's such a, a small inexpensive thing that a farmer could use but could really make the difference to their future and then just one more thing is i was said i was really strongly involved in the development of capacity within uh, countries and this is something that we're working with a private investment in morocco um, it's a uk morocco partnership as well with with cranfield university and this is um we've, we've developed a program of research so not only is this program building on the challenges and working out solutions to the challenges that have been found in Morocco and beyond in, in Africa in these seven different projects, but we're also recruiting and training over 20 early career African researchers to work on these projects alongside our Moroccan colleagues. So we are really building on um, uh, researchers for the future and making sure that uh, Iraq has resilience in the future using using research and that that's me for now thank you very much nicola um, i'm getting two strong feelings on that one is that you're really interested in helping the iraq ecology of training and mentoring and uh, enabling students etc to understand this and also develop its own research capability as well that that's uh, obviously uh, a key aspect there so thank you very much indeed um, moving on now to, hello Tom, Tom Williams, who's the Vice Chair of the British Waters International Forum, uh, and he's also uh, Chief Exec of NEBO. Uh, Tom's got some pretty exciting things I think he's going to show us, so over to you Tom, looking forward to hearing from it. Hey guys, how are you doing? Uh, thank you for having me this afternoon, and, uh, and lovely to uh, make all your acquaintance. Um, as, uh, as mentioned uh, by Ashley, I, I'm uh, from British Water, and British Water is a, a trade body uh, for the um, UK water sector. Um, and we represent uh, all those manufacturers and those guys uh, down the track who, who make this kit. So um, you're going to hear some similar things, but then also some new stuff. Um, all our members are uh, completely uh, commercial, uh, so they're um they're not uh, government funded they're not um a uh an institute that's connected to the government but they are private companies who manufacture this kit uh that we're going to show you uh and hopefully uh we can start off there so um one of the things that we started talking about uh when we were talking about uh, iraq was uh, leapfrogging and the opportunities to to learn from what the the UK is doing and and uh, here in the UK and around the world and and where where things are and uh, obviously uh, some of the things we've discussed here around digital technologies and, and satellites and, and the catchment based approach uh, are key to to what's going on and there are similar things happening in the UK to the to the rewetting of the the salt marshes that's going to be essential to to Iraq's uh, ecological future and farming future uh, where we're rewetting the peatlands uh, here in in northern Britain uh, in the north of the country uh, and we have these uh, large corporations these engineering firms like Arup and, and uh, RSK who uh, have a base in Basra as well uh, who are helping with these projects uh, and using some of the technologies that we're going to talk around. Uh, and where we're, where we're looking at is uh, not just uh, mapping uh, the soil quality, as, as has been discussed by the previous characters, but also tracking the, the water quality in real time and trying to improve that water quality uh, as it flows down uh, the catchment. Uh, and uh, some of the technologies here we have uh, Sentry uh, on the uh, on the right here, which is a, a microbial activity sensor, 
uh, and this can uh, is based on a microbial fuel cell and it can give you real time information uh, to the biological activity that's uh, in that water, whether it be a river, an irrigation channel, um, uh, or even a treatment works uh, uh, or a wastewater treatment works. Uh, and that kind of data can really help you optimize uh, the processes and maybe recycle uh, some of the nutrients out of that water. Uh, down in the, the uh, bottom uh, left, uh, just over one, we have uh, water, WTR, uh, who are a floating um, mic sensor that tells you uh, some of the phosphates, some of the, um, the salinity of the water. Uh, and we're using these in, in the fens uh, in the east of England uh, to track water quality uh, and sending them out remotely. Uh, and that information can be sent back to your cell phone. Uh, so you can set these free in the environment uh, and track uh, what's going on uh, across uh, a whole vast region uh, and connect that via either 4G or 5G. And we, we have discussed some of the connectivity issues, but satellite technology is, uh, is really where uh, the power of that is. Uh, and some of these uh, bits of kit are, are coming in very cheap now. Uh, some of the, the soil sensors, which is the, the gray and green one in the, in the middle that tells you the moisture in the soil uh, can come in at, at less than uh, 10 pounds or uh, $20 a unit. Uh, and can be hook, hooked up digitally uh, to satellite systems or uh, LoRaWAN, which is a long range wide area network sensor. Uh, and again, on the bottom left here, we have uh, the, an example of uh, one that is installed on a, on a farm building. And these uh, digital center um, antennae communicate with these bits of kit out in the field, uh, and they can go up to around 10 kilometers uh, and they take very little power uh, and they're very cheap and, and quick to install, meaning that you don't need uh, large fiber optic connections or um, satellite coverage at all times uh, or even uh, 4G connection from, from telephones in the, those areas. These lorry one uh, systems are, are cheap and easy to administrate uh, out in the countryside uh, and act as a base station uh, to where uh, maybe a stronger communication uh, channel can be accessed uh, and can communicate with the, the cell phones of the farmers out in the fields uh, way away from the, the buildings. Um, and as data uh, becomes cheaper and the, these bits of kit becomes cheaper, uh, it becomes a much faster way uh, to understand what's going on uh, in, the, in the field uh, and, and try and get an idea about where you might want to plant your crops. Um, as uh, was discussed in the last presentation, they were talking about soil quality, but that moisture uh, is, is what the plants are looking for. Uh, and here we're just accessing some uh, public data uh, that uh, should be available for uh, a rack as well. Uh, and this is LIDAR tracking technology uh, that tells you where the, the moisture is in the, uh, in the soil. Uh, and here we have a, a fo photograph of some of the Welsh farmers who've been using this to target their planting uh, according to where these are uh, and look at the runoff uh, from the rains that come in those particular areas uh, or where the rivers are flowing and the underground water is that they can uh, access uh, and uh, look at their planting accordingly. Uh, and this is a, a, is a larger scale where it's overlaid onto satellite uh, data. Uh, and you could see here in the, uh, to the right there, there's a, a large reservoir but there's large tracts of land where the, the runoff comes down the hills uh, that become particularly soggy uh, and they can target anything that they're doing there for maybe some remediation, maybe looking at the runoff that's going into there. So they might be losing some nitrates, they might be losing some phosphates uh, from the land uh, and it's gathering in these, uh, these areas of the, of the land and they can maybe recycle some of that water back up uh, to, to where it needs to be uh, applied. And here is some of the uh, the UK process technologies that we're, we're starting to apply is some of the, the companies that are, are doing some of the more engineering uh, heavy lifting type stuff. And I, and I believe there's an interest in this uh, in uh, Iraq. Uh, so on the left, we have uh, Maltby Biogas who are doing uh, what 
we consider to be a very mature uh, system now of uh, anaerobic digestion, uh, where they're taking uh, farm for, um, waste from the, the cow slurries uh, and pig slurries and mixing it also uh, with other waste from nearby industries. They take in uh, things like brewery waste, uh, and we're often seeing this applied across the actual um, sewage sector as well. Uh, so I know in Manchester we have a large pressurized digester system uh, where we produce 10 megawatts of energy uh, every single day uh, from the biogas that comes from there. Uh, and all you're doing there is you're putting this uh, in, a, in a large tank uh, and uh, keeping the oxygen out of there and, and the methane uh, uh, comes out of the top and you can tap that off uh, with uh, it being under pressure and actually clean that gas up and, and put it into gas powered engines to either produce electricity uh, or in the past we've actually piped that directly for home use for, for cooking and, and other applications. Um, this anaerobic digestion to, to biogas can be applied in so many different ways and in so many different scales. Uh, so I know I've worked in India where we've actually just built these as, as small concrete tanks uh, and tap them for, for very small villages uh, to, uh, to use as um, power for their stoves. Uh, or they can be giant power plants where you're, you're bringing in large amounts of city sludge and, um, and farm waste, and um, especially if you've got a lot of cattle and, and animals, uh, and putting that into the, to the digester to, to produce biogas. Um, and then the next step, after that, and this is where CCM technologies uh, on the right are, is they have a, a carbon capture uh, technology where they pump the CO2 into the, the digestate uh, and enhance the availability and the bioavailability of the phosphates and nitrates in that sludge. So whereas previously um, we were just taking some of that waste digestate after it had been finished in the digester uh, and maybe spreading it on land uh, and using it as a direct uh, soil enhancement situation. Here CCM uh, have taken that process a little bit further uh, and are using some more advanced processing to produce a very good commercial uh, fertilizer that uh, can be applied directly to uh, the, the fields without any uh, fear uh, of, of being any uh, problems with it, but also it's a carbon capture technology uh, as well. Uh, and then the final one on uh, this uh, slide here is uh, anaerobic MBR. An MBR is a membrane bioreactor. Uh, this one's at Spernal uh, Sewage so Treatment Works, um, which is in the Midlands with South, uh, Seven Trent Water. Um, and this is using specialist microbes um, that is being added uh, to uh, the, the treatment system here. And this is a, is a water treatment, a wastewater treatment system. Uh, and uh, again, producing energy from that. Uh, and this is the, the first uh, anaerobic membrane um, bioreactor in the UK uh, to, to be applied, because normally it's, uh, it's used in places like Brazil where the temperatures are, are warmer. Uh, but it's, uh, it's the future of net zero wastewater treatment for us um, and could be well applied uh, all across uh, the Middle East, uh, in, including Iraq. And then uh, this um, technology, solar water, uh, and I think this one is the one that people are most excited about, uh, certainly for, uh, for Iraq and uh, the, the Middle East. Um, and this is a, a solar desalination um, piece of kit and it's uh, uh, quite an exciting uh, application of technology uh, and we have the large central dome uh, and we have the the pipes coming in uh, where the uh, saline seawater comes into the dome uh, and using the heat of the sun only uh, and no moving parts uh, we evaporate the uh, the water and and then gather it on the in, internals of the dome and it runs down the outside and into a separation channel uh, giving us a, a highly concentrated brine uh, but then also a potable water or certainly a water that would be very suitable for irrigation um, and very cheap and easy to apply um, they come in uh, three standard uh, units um, 
the most popular are the uh, the 30 meter or the 60 meter uh, wide uh, setups, uh, and uh, as a relative scale, that gives you a uh, a 15 meter or 30 meter height, which uh, with depending on whichever you go for, uh, and they produce about 10,000 meter cubes a day of fresh water. Um, and not only do they produce fresh water, as you can um, reprocess that uh, highly saline brine to pr produce commercial salt. Uh, so if you had this in, in a, a loop system, uh, you could continue to uh, send it around the loop and, and evaporate more and more of the, the water and recover that as uh, desalinated water. Um, but then also you can recover the salt and have a commercial uh, agriculturally uh, available uh, product that you can sell um, as a basic thing, even a, a salt lick, uh, but even fit for human consumption. Um, and we have a couple being built in, um, in your region, one in Neom in Saudi Arabia uh, and one just over the border in, in Jordan, a, a phosphate mine. Um, and Okta International is the, uh, the company that's representing uh, this uh, organization in, uh, in Iraq. Um, and they're very excited about the, the opportunity to uh, produce a commercially available brine processing unit that recovers uh, water uh, that can be used for, for irrigation and, and for human consumption. Uh, so I think that's the, the most exciting of the, of the technologies that I've got for you uh, today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. That's really uh, interesting. And just out of interest, what do they retail at? What, what's the sort of, you know, I like the £10 sensors, which is obviously accessible to everybody. Obviously, a water dome might be a bit more expensive, but how much is that? And how many, how much can, how much water can that process? It can, those standard setups can process um, up to uh, 10,000 meter cubes a day. So it's a significant amount of water, uh, certainly enough for a, for a large uh, industrial scale farm. Um, and they, they, they can apply the technology at smaller scale as well. So it can be uh, even down to uh, individual small farmer setups, but uh, certainly there's more interest in that, that larger scale uh, setup. Um, on the pricing front, it depends on the scale, of course, uh, but they do have commercial partners and they have commercial partners that are looking to invest uh, in uh, Iraq. Uh, and if they're are people who can cooperate to get the salt to market with them will back that uh, so that the access to it is uh, is fairly easy really uh, there is no large financial barrier uh, to uh, to bring in this to market in iraq tom that sounds like music to everybody's ears you're probably going to be bombarded with people interested could you expand a little bit more on on, on there is no cost <laughs> yeah, so uh, there, there is no cost would be a, 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 um, a great thing. But what's going on is uh, they've uh, partnered with a, a series of funds. Uh, so there, there is no uh, outlay for the farmers. Uh, and they, they, they're partnering uh, on the basis that the commercial um, price of the, the, the salt and the brine that can be applied would be uh, profitable uh, for them. Uh, so they would be uh, investing in the market and employing people locally. What they're looking for is uh, commercial partners locally. Uh, so there wouldn't be a barrier uh, that that commercial partner would have to bring um, money to the table, but they would have to bring expertise, access to markets uh, and talent, of course, uh, that would be accessible uh, to in invest their, their time and efforts into this. Thank you very much. Um, that, I think concludes the main presentations. Um, I'd like to just tee up a couple of points that maybe um, possibly Roth Hampstead and possibly um, you know, Agri Epicenter might particularly look at is uh, how to deal with very saline soils. Have you got solutions that might be, uh, you could look at, I know you can monitor soils, but there, have you got solutions for improving soils? Would anyone, Shamal, have you got some thoughts on that or, or um, Nicola? Yes, uh, I mean, I can go. I think it's, it's, it's important, as I mentioned, first of all, for us to understand the level of the, you know, the salinity in the soil. I think that is that's, that's going to be my first point. I think the next one is, is about the mitigation and, and improving the soil. I think some of the 
technology um, mentioned, uh, Tom mentioned around digestate or, or even a compost. There are ways you can uh, bring the, the level of organic matter and, and the, the quality of soil up in order to be able to improve the salinity. Uh, but that is, you know, the, the soil is a long-term business and it, it needs a long-term investment and vision and commitment. And I think if, if that is there, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure the technology as well as the knowledge and the agronomy uh, science would help building up that soil quality in, in a long run, but it need a, a, a long commitment and, 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 and some sort of a, a long strategy as well. I don't know if Nicola would add anything else. Yeah, not, not, not to follow up on your, your carry on with your, your soils talk, I, I've come from the other direction as well. I'd be looking at improving crops so to cope with the salinity. Mm. So, so um, looking at even novel crops that could, you know, we could have some usable product at the end of it and could almost as well, if you intercropped it or something like that, you could improve the soil on the long, long term as well. Um, so um, Shamil can do the soil, I'll do the crop. <laughs> okay, and presumably you've got crops that, that might already be very uh, saline tolerant. Uh, yes, what yes, kind of things would they be? Well, we've got, I, mean, I can't, um, I'm not quite sure um, off the top of my head, but I know we do work with different grasses and that sort of thing to, to produce some sort of grains as well. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think, yeah, I think a crop like Mangaroo, for example, is a very salinity tolerance crop. But I mean, this is a good point, Ashley. You know, the farmers in Iraq, if, if your soil is too saline and you can grow some sort of a, uh, a, a, a crop or a tree that is suitable, so that might be as well as a, as a source of income where you can sequestrate more carbon in a soil, you're not using it for agriculture. So that might open up a new market for some of this land, which is not marginal. But we worked with a company, they looking at desalining the water and the soil as well. So there are technological advancement, but I think you need the long-term uh, uh, thinking. I thought Tom's uh, idea of uh, using sludge or possibly human waste even to, to make it into energy fertilizer and to improve the soil yeah. could be a really good answer for someone like Basra or somewhere where, where maybe the soil is a bit more salty. Oh, yeah, there's, there's, there's huge opportunities for that. And uh, it's a very well proven technology uh, and been popular for the last uh, 20 years or so in, in the UK and Europe. So it, it would be a great application for that. Thank you. I just want to bring in um, uh, Timothy Robertson and possibly Eric here because uh, the idea of doing a smart farm in Iraq propped up and uh, obviously there might be issues of land, how you do it, there may be collectivization, aggregation issues for the market, uh, there could be all sorts of ways to improve productivity. Um, uh, Timothy, is that something the World Bank might be interested to, to kind of sponsor, um, particularly with you know, research capacity, uh, in the country training, mentoring. Could, could you expand on what you might be able to do? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that the, uh, I think the way that we would phrase this perhaps is, is slightly differently. You know, it seems to me that in a, in a context of somewhere like Iraq and, and um, all the, the technologies and innovations that, that we're talking about is, um, is looking at proof of concept, right? So, uh, looking at uh, uh, models that are uh, that can be put on the ground and demonstrate um, that they, them, they themselves are sustainable, and I think that the, perhaps the, the, the challenge with a kind of demonstration farm approach is, is maybe it's sustainability and who would be financing it, what's popping it up, etc. But I think so to take it slightly towards a more private sector approach, you know, looking for, for organizations and uh, groups of farmers, groups of private sector actors who want to come together, demonstrate proof of, of concept, show that um, a way of working, a way of aggregating, a way of uh, enabling access to finance and enabling an access to, to technology, uh, that kind of approach, I think, is, is exactly what Iraq needs. So maybe not quite uh, fully in the, along the demonstration farm, approach, but along that, that idea of, of how can we demonstrate the proof of our concept is, is workable and sustainable and actually build, can be built upon. That's, that's, that would be my take. Thank you. Uh, Eric, is this something that, uh, that the ITC is looking at in terms of marketization uh, to, 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 to test hypotheses or? 
Are you there, okay? Yeah, yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Actually, we, we, we've just uh, finalized a, a study on uh, environment and, and, and climate uh, implications. And we are indeed looking uh, for some, uh, you know, uh, practical and, and applicated, applicable options. But I would just, you know, what, repeat what Timothy and just echo what he says. I mean, it's in terms of, again, sustainability, how this fits the current context and how commercially viable this is as well. Can I make just a quick comment? I mean, based on our experience, because we've been running international smart farm in China and Paraguay for a couple of years. So the way we work is obviously we have a, a, a basic funding from Innovate UK, which is the UK government, but also a commitment from the Chinese government, as well as engaging with uh, Tianjin Food Group, for example. So we are currently collaborating with the largest food manufacturing company in Tianjin uh, to sustain and then develop this uh, smart farm approach. But I think that's something for a Department of International Trade, Ashley, as well. So because they are very keen on pushing uh, the idea of the smart farm internationally into other countries because of what we've done in the last couple of years, it, it shows there is a, the value for the agri-tech sector in the UK. Okay, thank you very much. Um, would anyone else on the panel like to, to add anything to what's been said so far? We're looking at skills, we're looking at actual technologies that can be used. Um, you know, it, 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 how do you get things to practically be delivered? Do you have to have government involved in this? Do you have to have the private sector? I mean, what, what is, do people just randomly try and get involved or do you really need a big push behind this? Uh, so uh, just to uh, shout up a little from the, the commercial side of things, um, we found that uh, there's uh, plenty of appetite to invest uh, in, in improvements uh, and that smart sensors and setting baselines um, is helping uh, banks and uh, the finance sector uh, justify the investment and, and track the improvements and having those trackers that show that uh, we started here uh, and we invested this money and we got to this level of water improvement and this level of soil improvement uh, is, is a real game changer uh, in um, attracting international monies. And that's why I said about the, the solar water team, they've got financial backers, they just need to partner with uh, organizations on the ground that are uh, strong enough to bring that together uh, and then the commercials can come from that. There is a very uh, direct question here that says, how much is the price of solar water system? So that's a bit of a, is that a buying signal, I wonder? Well, well, maybe, yes. Well, uh, maybe they uh, need to reach out to us and we can have that conversation because, uh, um, you know, it, location, uh, scale, uh, those, those sort of things. It's not as simple as um, buying off the shelf. But uh, yes, certainly we can uh, uh, discuss that. OK, so you're, you're already available. Um, I think probably for the moment we're, we're coming to the, the end of the, this um, session, which I think has put out there some pretty innovative ideas, the opportunities in Iraq in terms of only half the, the, the land is actually being used uh, effectively. Um, there's an opportunity for young people. Uh, uh, what we missed earlier was a supply chain opportunity here. For every farmer, there's five people in the supply chain and, and uh, in food, for example, that get employment. So if you get 10,000 more farmers, you get another 50,000 uh, jobs. So there's a very good equation for young people in particular. Um, and I think, the, I think you're already and willing to cooperate you know, we have universities listening in, maybe maybe everyone can talk to each other a bit more. Uh, it's quite clear that Shamal and Nicola do help and support uh, other organizations to, to develop their capacities. Tom's got some direct kit that can be plugged in. Um, Timothy's there with, you know, sort of real support, you know, with 100 million sitting in the back there to help the infrastructure and get it going. And Eric's there too, to get the infrastructure and the markets organized. So, so I kind of see you guys as a pretty good solution for everything at the moment. So I would recommend that you keep in touch anyway, um, but also that everyone can then uh, be in touch with you. I notice in the chat, and there's almost too many for me to follow, people have put their emails in, they put their contacts in there. Um, and I think uh, you, anyone uh, can get in touch with IBBC and we'll put them in touch with with uh, whoever's listening or who, whoever is on the panel. So with that, is there anything any of you'd like to say in conclusion, uh, each of you just a, a couple of words? I mean, uh, Eric, would you like to, uh, to, to finish and uh, to, to say something and then Timothy and then Tom and Shamal and Nicola? Yeah, thanks, Ashley. Well, you know, again, I think it's indeed uh, an important things to to brainstorm again and make sure that this this remains a, 
a collective uh, efforts. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, of great ideas, uh, you know, fast uh, pace as well, like it's uh, it's being said in the in the chat box. But uh, for us again, uh, what what matters is that uh, you know through through those private sector initiatives that we also manage you know, to embark uh, public institutions and agencies along the ways that will be the one uh, that will have uh, further down the responsibility to ensure sustainability. And also to make sure that all these efforts that are being led by the private sector, by the, the investors as well, are being accompanied uh, by a solid and con conducive policy framework. There's still a lot of work to be done when it comes to laws, uh, regulations and, and, and policies. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, Timothy, anything to add from your point of view to uh, the final flourish? Sure. <laughs> you know, I, I'd certainly um, uh, reiterate that the point that Eric has made with regard to policy. You know, the, the past two decades have, if it, have taught us anything is that um, investment in the agricultural sector needs to be combined with a discussion around what's the what's the enabling environment going forward and how do we. Um, uh, support the change of that. My view is that the current food system is not fit for purpose and that in 15, 20 years time, you know, Iraq faces some real challenges in, in providing people with access to affordable, healthy, healthy food. Um, but that challenge is, is, is really an opportunity. So pressing on both sides, bringing the evidence about what an enabling environment might look like and bringing the tools and technology and, and innovation um, that I think it, it richly deserved in, in Iraq, and Iraq has, the, has a huge uh, youth endowment and huge uh, endowment of uh, intellectual capital. So all of those things need to be maximised. The one thing I, I would say at the end of end of this discussion with regard to salinity and the soil, you know, there is work being done globally on rethinking the way that soil is financed and thought about, and I, I think that you know some some of those. Uh, the underlying basis of how we get Iraq's uh, resources to be thought of, natural resources to be thought of and to be managed effectively, those are some of the most profound uh, elements, I think, of what we've discussed today. And they, they need to somehow come to the front and center and uh, for us to be as innovative and creative as possible. Thanks. Thank you. Can I just put the idea that agriculture or highly productive agriculture really is the most virtuous of any industry to look at because you can feed people, you can provide jobs, you can modernize, you can provide young people with opportunities, um, you can improve the environment, that all these things are within this one, one industry effectively. So, uh, you know, I hope it's going to be a, a big priority going forward. Shamal, you're, you're an Iraqi. Uh, yes, you well, I, I think it's, it's a complex, it's a agriculture and food production and the challenges we are facing, especially in Iraq, is a, is a very complex and need a a collaborative sort of ecosystem for all agencies, organization, as well as government, a, a long-term commitment in order to understand exactly what needed from the farmer's perspective and what sort of technology and capabilities would help them to move in into the next step and the next stage. And I think that is, for me, is, is crucial, getting that sort of a commitment from the, especially from government and, and support because even in the UK and the EU, there is a huge support for, to the farmers to be sustainable and productive. So we need to get that commitment from the public as well as private sector. But I'm, I'm sure it's doable and is, is something that, uh, you know, Iraq agriculture can be leading the world in, in terms of productivity and sustainability. Thank you very much. Nicola. Yeah, I'm going to put a more positive spin on it, really. It's like, I think this is an excellent opportunity to get it right. And I think that, um, you know, we've, we've got all the technologies here. We've, we've got the, the universities that are willing to, to interact and build. And I believe that it very, it, you know, we, we will have private investment, but they will be, they'll be funding their, their own agricultural systems very soon. And that's what the aim would be, is to work with the universities, to bring forward the researchers, the farmers, working with, uh, you know, agricultural universities as well to really take this forward and make this their own, you know, and um, this is a, a, an opportunity and uh, I think we should all grasp it. It's good. Thank you very much. How positive. Tom, finally. Yes, and finally, thank you. And I think Timothy uh, hit it on the head there with uh, rethink investment. Uh, that's the way that the, the private sector is going. 
uh, for uh, environmental and agricultural improvements uh, and digital information setting that baseline for that, enabling that, uh, that investment to flourish. Uh, that with capacity building on the ground and it, it can be a wonderful success. I'm very optimistic about it. Well, thank you all very much indeed. Uh, this will be available as a video and we're now seamlessly going to transition into the second phase. You're all welcome to stay. I might black you out if that's okay, and bring forward the more the SME sector, uh, private companies on the ground, practicalities, lots of potatoes, um, and, and some interesting part two. So if I could just transition seamlessly uh, into phase two, uh, which is the SMEs active in Iraq, and I'm calling forward um, David Cordobes, um, I'm calling forward Duha from Innovation Hub, uh, George Villa, Ali Suhail from Capita, I can see there, Ali. Uh, Omar Dwakat from Alvan Blanche Group. John Taylor and HK Potato, Jabbar Tahir. So do we have the team? Thank you. Um, thank you all very much. Um, thanks for sticking with us. I think you'll find it was a pretty interesting first half. Um, I'm looking for David Cordobes, if you're there, David. I'd like you to, to start, if you like, talking about what's happening with youth and SMEs in, in Iraq. Thank you, uh, thank you, Ashley, and uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to to IBBC, uh, but also to to our Capita who uh, extended the invitation to uh, to us. Uh, you heard from my uh, my colleague Eric uh, before um, regarding a Savvy uh, project, and uh, actually, I'm leading uh, one of the the sub component uh, of this project. I also have the the background it comes with the package. Uh, and basically, the, my role in this, uh, in this project is to, um, to take a particular look to, to youth and how to uh, improve um, uh, youth entrepreneurship in the value chain that uh, Rick has mentioned, uh, agriculture and, uh, and agribusiness, and how to uh, well, promote an enabling business environment for, for those young entrepreneurs. Um, and... Uh, I mean, uh, I've been involved in this project. It's been now uh, several, several months. Uh, and th there is a striking uh, aspect um, regarding uh, entrepreneurship uh, among youth in, in Iraq that I could hear from um, uh, different stakeholders I could engage with, uh, from ministries to incubators, accelerators, uh, is... Uh, I was going to use uh, the word in English reluctance, but might not be the right word, but not necessarily a good, a strong appetite for entrepreneurship uh, and, uh, and more uh, interest to, to work in the, in the public sector. Uh, and I'm not even talking about uh, agriculture sector, uh, which is uh, something that is not uh, necessarily uh, appealing to, uh, to youth in Iraq, but also in many countries uh, where we operate. Uh, we heard the same in, um, in sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America, so it's not it's no exception. Now, um, when uh, when preparing for this uh, for this uh, this panel, uh, the point was to to look at also um, how um, can we uh, engage much more uh, youth uh, towards entrepreneurship, uh, but also how as well, uh, everybody can play its role. And I heard a word, uh, some people might say it's a buzzword, but I like the word, it's ecosystem. Uh, and um, um, my, um, the, the, the program that I'm leading and uh, the activities and the, the department I belong to in ITC, strongly believe in ecosystem. It's called institutions and ecosystem, that's the name of the department. And um, historically, uh, ITC, uh, we look strongly to um, institutions as multiplier of our activities in different countries where we operate. And um, the more uh, we get into uh, how to bring a cross-cutting aspect in our project like gender, but also uh, youth, the more uh, we could see as well opening the scope to a galaxy of um, uh, different uh, actors and uh, not necessarily only relying on the government uh, to uh, foster youth entrepreneurship in countries where we operate. And uh, in, the case, uh, in the case of, uh, of Iraq and uh, in the case of Savi, uh, we apply a recipe that has shown to be working in, in many countries and I'm talking about Afghanistan, but also all the countries where we operate, 
which is really working with the different uh, actors of this ecosystem uh, that I'm going to, to mention after, uh, but partly looking at different layers where we have to intervene. And of course, policy makers are important, of course, to have a conducive business environment for entrepreneurship and to, to foster innovation, to foster attractiveness to, of youth towards entrepreneurship and uh, setting up their startup is important. But also what is really important is to look at, uh, well, organization like yours, uh, chambers of commerce, but also associations, but also uh, the ones that are uh, more towards um, youth, uh, I would say, much, make them much more attractive to, to entrepreneurship, like incubators and accelerators. And um, I see Capita, for example, on the screen, uh, but also uh, many other organizations. Uh, but also uh, universities, uh, I heard College of Agriculture before, uh, but also uh, other actors like association and youth uh, civil organization that can be also active as part of this ecosystem. And this is something that we will uh, strengthen uh, more and more as part of our activities in the context of, of SAVI. So strengthening key support organization, this is, uh, this is key. Uh, because if we want to, uh, to train uh, young people to become entrepreneurs, or if you want to accompany young startups uh, to thrive and to innovate, again, there, the point is not to work only with uh, one specific uh, actor. It's a combination of the efforts of uh, this ecosystem uh, in order to uh, make sure that innovation, exchange of information, um, mentorship as well schemes, access to finance that was mentioned before are uh, well uh, fluid uh, for, for, for our beneficiaries. Something else uh, as well that I would like to, to mention is uh, this is something that we strongly believe in ITC. Uh, Eric has mentioned market-led intervention um, and also the fact that when supporting SMEs, uh, they have to find the right skills to become more competitive. So in the case of uh, our uh, startups uh, that we are talking, going to talk about today, it's very important to be connected with the educational system. Uh, and this is something that uh, we will look at as well in the context of SAVI, uh, the, uh, with the, the support of the European Union, is uh, how do we connect with uh, all the projects that are acting towards, for example, working with vocational and education training institutions. And how do we also connect those two worlds, private sector development, but also access to schemes uh, in order to, uh, to be more competitive, of course, uh, because uh, uh, many studies have shown that uh, if you want to be more competitive with your SMEs, you need to find the right skills to do so. That's, uh, that's uh, an, an, obvious, uh, an obvious statement. Uh, finally, as well, um, What's, uh, what I was mentioning before is uh, the, the importance of uh, okay, acting at the different levels, but also to flag the voices of the youth uh, to, to different stakeholders and particularly at the policy level. And uh, this is something that uh, is done very uh, actively by some stakeholders, particularly incubators and accelerators. And I'm thinking about, sorry, I mentioned Capita a lot. It's not because they invited you, son, but also because they are really active on the scene. Uh, but Capita is, uh, is producing um, a lot of uh, literature about, about that, but also facts and figures that show how things are evolving, uh, where innovation lies, particularly in the agriculture sector. There was an issue uh, two months ago by Capita about uh, youth in agriculture, for example. But also um, what's important behind that is in order to attract uh, young people to this, uh, to this sector, whether as young micro-entrepreneurs and even startups, I think what's very important is to let celebrate them as well. And this is one of the key aspects that uh, I see in many countries is to, to show that there are possibilities and to create awareness about this sector, uh, whether with unicorns of tomorrow uh, in Iraq, that's great, but also showing that there are possibilities in the agriculture sector uh, for future entrepreneurs. And uh, it's part of the awareness raising that has to be done by the ecosystem as well. So uh, in a nutshell, my message is uh, there's a, a combination of efforts uh, between government, between incubators, accelerators, the TVET system, chambers like yours. And thanks again for this event. And of course, the involvement of the private sector uh, that is active in this, uh, in this sector today uh, in order to, but to foster entrepreneurship in, uh, in a very promising uh, sector like agriculture and agribusiness. I'll stop here. Thank you.
Thank you, David. Just, so, so thank you very much. Just to understand that you're, you're helping to create an ecosystem. Are you putting money into that to, to make that happen? Are you bringing expertise? How do you specifically do that? Just, just briefly, yeah. Yes, of course, of course. Um, there are several aspects to, to look at. Uh, when uh, we talk, for example, about uh, incubators and accelerators, uh, we, are, we, we set up an expertise in uh, making sure that those institutions, I call them institutions, work better from different aspects. So product and services proposed to the community, connection with the reality of the beneficiaries, but also connection with other actors. And that's why, I mean, uh, what we do in general is a, an ecosystem mapping uh, around the different actors in a given sector for a, a specific um, uh, beneficiary profile. In order, and sometimes there are some institutions that suspected that others were doing some activities, but didn't know that well. So the point is not necessarily to do another okay. report, but also to bring forces together and uh, define an action plan in order to uh, to be complementary. Okay, thank you. So you're you're the enabler. Thank you very much, David. Uh, now, just to move on to Duha uh, from the Innovation Hub, the Oxfam Innovation Hub, who's actually doing this on the ground. Um, and obviously, you're going to be interacting, hopefully, David, with her in the future. Duha, would you tell us about what you've been doing and what's happening with Iraqi entrepreneurs now? Hi, good Hi. afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure, actually, to hear about uh, all of the panelists and all of the research and the effort that is actually being put into supporting agriculture in Iraq. So uh, I work in Iraq Response Innovation Lab. Uh, it's a part of a global initiative uh, that is funded by several uh, large NGOs. And uh, the one that is in Iraq is currently hosted by Oxfam. Uh, as the Iraq Response Innovation Lab, we support a lot of entrepreneurs. We support a lot of innovators in multiple sectors, but today we're going to focus on the uh, specific incubator that we had, which is the agribusiness incubator. Um, a lot of people have shared a lot of challenges, a lot of reasons to focus on agriculture, but for us as the innovation lab, the main reason that we wanted to focus so much on agriculture is because of the link between history of innovation and, and agriculture and how it goes back thousands of years ago to Iraq. Um, one of the things that we employ, like the modality that we use, is to go from the bottom-up uh, approach, despite the many challenges that uh, that is with this approach. As you know, there's a lack of capacity, there's a lack of knowledge and all of that, but that's where the innovation lab comes in, as we provide a lot of technical support and we also provide uh, funding. So I'm going to share a small presentation that is going to highlight some of the uh, projects that are currently transitioning from a prototype to a pilot. And uh, this is an ongoing process that is taking place as we talk today. A lot of these projects uh, recently started purchasing. They rented out their spaces. And in this presentation, I'm only going to focus on three of them. Um, so the, oops, let me see. Aha. The first one that I want to share with you today is called Towards a Green Desert. And it's actually very uh, exciting to hear about uh, the other uh, panelists because they talked about combining IoT technology with smart irrigation. And this is exactly what Towards a Green Desert is about. So uh, this project or this enterprise is established in Ambar and Basically, farmers uh, and farms in Ambar have a lot of difficulties when it comes to irrigation. There is the issues of drought, and there's also an issue of knowledge. Um, oftentimes, farmers are not exactly 100% sure about what, type, what kind of water is needed for tomatoes and what kind of water uh, quantity of water is needed for potatoes and all of that. But with this particular system, which is done in a collaboration between agronomist and IT uh, specialist, it helps the farmer to uh, control, to modify and to manage, and also to adjust the irrigation system remotely through a mobile application. And this is going to be launched initially in Ambar, but since this is a service that can be expanded to, to the rest of Iraq, we're looking forward to it to be established and, you know, uh, and launched well in Ambar, and we can look up for opportunities for expansion. This is a prototype uh, of what it is, and uh, the thing about it is going to be also assimilated to local language, so the 
mobile application is going to be in Arabic, so as to avoid any linguistic challenges that uh, anyone could encounter. The second one is called Golden Mushroom, and this one is going to, it's launched in, uh, in Mosul, recently got registered, and Golden Mushroom is a uh, Talks, it's focusing on the food security and also on the availability of locally grown organic uh, mushroom. So cultivating mushroom might seem like something that is straightforward, but what's innovative about this project is that it takes farm waste, which is something that virtually has zero value. And the uh, Muhammad, the project uh, manager, has figured out a way to uh, mix it into a specific compost, which works as the base to create uh, organically grown mushroom. And you can see here, like he uses some uh, waste from uh, farms and there is a specific way to do it. Uh, also, he plans not only to sell the mushroom, but also to promote uh, for people to, to grow their own mushrooms and he will be selling his compost as well. Third one, which is my favorite actually, it's called Arabia Dam, which means eternal spring. Uh, this one is uh, more focused on uh, animal herding. The main reason that I love this, uh, this particular project is because it allowed me to learn so much about a, the technology related to barley sprouting and the hydroponic system, and also because of the impact that it has on people. So um, I'm not sure how uh, familiar you are with the, the governorate of Ambar, but people there, a lot of them work with uh, herding animals, uh, sheep, cows, and all of that. And most of them use uh, like, you know, planes that usually just have a natural uh, fodder in them. But as uh, there are a lot of challenges related to accessibility and security, the planes are not that safe in a lot of cases, and it poses a lot of danger to uh, the people who work there. With this particular project, uh, we'll be able to produce green uh, barley fodder, which is a great source of nutrition for uh, the uh, for these animals. Uh, the uh, market for that is estimated to be around 300 tons uh, per day, based on the studies that the uh, enterprise owner has made. He already made connections uh, with people and will be ready to produce within the upcoming weeks. Uh, one thing that I want to highlight is that all of these projects are under what we call the Go Green umbrella, and it's an initiative that not only focuses on using green energy and green resources, but it also focuses on supporting Iraq, because green, we believe, is a, is a major part of what Iraq is about. So all of these projects will be using solar panel energy as the main source of, uh, of energy. And that's, I think, where I, I see a lot of potential with the collaboration with some of the enterprises here that deal with the solar uh, energy. Solar energy is still something that is newly more or less introduced to Iraq. So the more we learn from experts, the better. Um, I also want to highlight that the support that we give is not purely financial. Uh, we've been working with these partners for um, around nine months. Uh, we've been supporting them in developing their plans, developing their uh, sustainability, because startups have a lot of risk, specifically in the first year. This is where startups usually fail because of lack of planning or lack of awareness to challenges that may arise. So we invest a lot of time in business training and uh, uh, creating forms that to track the enterprise uh, performance so that we're able to tackle these issues as we go along. And what we're looking for is, well, why we support innovators uh, here in Iraq, but we believe that the innovation process requires everyone to be on board. It requires a strong uh, ecosystem. It requires uh, for sharing and, and for collaboration. And that's basically what we're looking for here. We're looking for ways to connect these uh, individuals, to connect these uh, established enterprises with private sector, with government actors, with expert institutes that might have technologies that we're not aware of yet. And also with any investors or donors that will be interested in scaling up and supporting these projects. Uh, we have other projects coming up as well. There is one that is focusing on capacity uh, building for farmers. 
And I saw that many of you have mentioned that as a part of uh, their what they're looking for. So it'd be really great to catch up on that. We also have something about mobile application and how to create market linkages within the agriculture sector using that technology. Um, I'm very excited to uh, connect with all of you to, to hear more about your projects because I believe that there's a lot of potential in Iraqi innovators and uh, all we have to do is just link them up with the right people. And here are some information here. I'm going to share that on the chat. And if you guys have any questions, please go ahead. Duha, thank you so much. That was really exciting. And obviously there's no shortage of talent in Iraq. It just needs people to help support and mentor it and provide income for it. So I'm sure someone listening will think this is great. And you know, someone I'm sure will step forward to support you. Um, if, with that, I'm gonna go straight to Ali Suhal next and then on to uh, Georges Villa. Uh, because we're talking about people with money here who invest in things, uh, but, you know, with their hearts in the right places. So, uh, Ali, can I uh, leave, leave you to speak now and, and what you're doing in Iraq and how you can invest? So what you mentioned a bit. So, uh, Thank you very much, Ashley, and thank you very much for setting this up. I, uh, I guess, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, we, we, we uh, just, let me just introduce myself. So I'm Ali al Suhail. I'm the manager of the Iraqi Angel Investors Network. I'm also the managing director of investments at Capita. Uh, and uh, we we are a private sector development company, so we do a lot of things within that uh, context. We develop, uh, we help develop programs that related to incubation acceleration uh, and, and help uh, companies across the board. Uh, we provide research, as uh, David mentioned, we have actually recently uh, produced a report on agriculture in Iraq and, and, and provide an overview of that. Uh, and the third, the, uh, third thing that we do is we do investments. Uh, we invest uh, on, as capita and we do also invest with our angel investors network. Uh, so we do have a, 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 an access uh, to capital through that. Uh, I guess we have a very much big interest in agriculture overall because we do see this as a, as a really a, a very a, a sector with a, a huge opportunity in Iraq. Uh, Iraq has been historically been known as a, an agri culture actually based economy, but this with the rise of oil and, and, and sh the focus has shifted more toward oil and uh, uh, and, and sort of agriculture has suffered from a lot of mismanagement and got lost uh, in, in that transformation. And, and now when we are, st uh, uh, again, speaking about diversifying the economy, of course, agriculture present a huge opportunity. Uh, so uh, what we are looking for is we're looking uh, to, to look at the, we work a lot with the startups. Uh, we, we work a lot with tech-based uh, firms. So, uh, but our mandate is to work with SMEs across the board. And that's why we are want to do so, uh, similar uh, things that we have done with the startups. We want to do them with the agriculture phase. And if there is a kind of uh, a shift, uh, businesses that are using both tech and agriculture, then that is something that we even more exciting for us. Uh, there is a huge opportunity in the sector, as I mentioned. There is a, a, it, Iraq was an agriculture based economies so of course it makes sense for uh, for this sector to grow quite uh, fast i mean we all remember the stories about iraqi date it used to be called the black land in, uh, historically because of the amount of greenery that was in it uh, um, and we are looking to do develop programs so we have some programs that we are internally developing uh, to promote um, agriculture with that, that sort of uh, scale, uh, uh, scale ups incubators innovation labs that uh, uh, with 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 uh, with on the ground innovation lab to to help and develop uh, develop them but at the same uh, time what we are actively looking for is is really startups with good uh, strong commercial models uh, and innovative local solutions uh, that we can invest in or bring other investors in. Uh, we see a lot of talk about agriculture. There's a lot, there's a great interest in it, but actually on the ground, we see very little SMEs sort of startup emerging within that scope. Most of the SMEs and the startups are focused on what we call like, they're not really actually solving agriculture problems, more solving like um, consumer problems. So they give you clean your garden, they give you some, uh, some plans to, to to put at your house, but they're not actually, actually going to the farmer and solving the problem that they have. At the same time, farmers uh, are not the easiest uh, sort of segment in the market to deal with. There is a uh, lack of sophistication, lack of education, that, uh, and there's a huge uh, bridge between the, uh, these uh, two factors. Um, youth in generally globally have been 
in, uh, we've seen declining interest in agriculture. It's becoming sort of a, a sector that has, over with time, has become a little bit less interesting from a lot of people. But with the green movement that is going on globally, with the talk about sustainability, agriculture, and green is becoming uh, at the forefront for a lot of people. And we went, we want to bring such thinking into Iraq. So we want entrepreneurs to start thinking about agriculture as a sector where they can build. It's not just for farmers. It's not just not for uh, sort of an old sector that uh, you shouldn't be working with, but it's actually a sector with very lucrative opportunities uh, that you can go in and make a good investment and good return on your investment. Uh, what, are, what are we looking for? Uh, we have programs that we developed in-house that we are uh, looking to to sort of uh, for donors and funders to, uh, to initiate these programs. We're also happy to implement programs. Um, I mean, I, uh, we are looking on multiple fronts uh, with, uh, to, to propose uh, for programs uh, that uh, uh, for, uh, sort of organization looking to implement. Well, uh, personally, I'm looking for investments. Uh, I'm looking for startups and SMEs that uh, are interested in raising funds and, are, and they have a good commercial and a local front. So if anyone feel they have um, ideas or they can make introduction, we're more than happy to have this conversation and I'll leave my email in the chat. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Ali. I think it's about making agriculture sexy again to young people you know uh you've got tech you've got green there's two good reasons to get into it i think and maybe we just need to communicate that a bit more and obviously maybe you can work with duha as well she's probably got some very good people for you um moving on to george villa who's also one of our members and also invests very much in smes and he's george from uh bell finance george over to you thank you very much i don't so i'm not on video uh you blocked me Probably I'm not pretty enough. Uh, am I, uh, ah, okay, I'm going to start my video. All right, here we are. Well, I'm I'm profoundly intimidated by by all the presentations uh, so far, the previous presentations, particularly during the first uh, uh, part of the session uh, or the first session. Uh, I. I'm, imp I'm impressed by their uh, depth, uh, sophistication, and the range of products that, that uh, are, in theory, available to the agricultural sector in Iraq. I would like to share our, our activities in Iraq are far more modest, I would say. I'm going to share the screen, and I hope this will work. Uh, okay. Oops. Do you see anything? No, probably not. Yes, George, it's all good. Go for it. Do you see the presentation? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, we, um, I'm the general manager of Bell Finance LLC. It's a company uh, created in the U.S. Uh, uh, almost two years ago uh, to continue the, the lending and educational activities of the Iraq Middle Market Development Foundation in Iraq, IMDEF. I was created in 2005 by the, the request of the U.S. government and funded by what was at the time OPIC, um, Overseas Private Investment Corporation, today it's DFC, Development Finance Corporation, a much large, larger organization. We received three credit facilities and since 2005, the story can be told very quickly, uh, we financed 53 projects dispersing almost $80 million at an average of $1.5 million per loan. Um, gross revenues of, uh, we were supposed to finance SMEs, nobody frankly ever pay too much attention to try to define an SME. We looked at gross revenues more than number of employment. We uh, finance projects that generate employment and economic growth or make the existing employment more sustainable. And as you can see in the, in the first uh, chart, in the first pie actually, 21% uh, of our disbursements went to agriculture and food processing. I should say more food processing than agriculture. 
for the risk because of the risks involved in uh, pure agriculture in, in growing a crop. Uh, the largest uh, percentage went to industry and manufacturing and uh, it, as you can see in the second uh, pie, it was throughout the country from uh, Basra to the hook. Uh, private sector, of course, uh, agricultural, manufacturing, industrial, and a few other smaller activities, media, education, construction, etc. We um, finance companies that uh, existing companies with um, with a history, with an established market presence, with uh, competent marketing, uh, with um, preferably with externally audited financial statements for the previous three to five years, dollar denominated, and uh, three to five years to essentially purchase equipment or finance expansions, warehouses or expansions of activity, working capital to some extent. Um, we are, as in a famous phrase in the UK, more comfortable with practice and theory. So in exhibit one at the bottom, I will show you some photographs of projects that we financed over the years. We also offered an internship program, three to five months uh, paid in Erbil. Well, we were able to do it. Well, the security conditions were um, reasonable to bring people from uh, American University of Sulimania, uh, people from the London School of Economics in the UK, Universidad de Navarra in Spain, and King's College in Canada. We had some extraordinary uh, interns participating. Some of them came for two or three, two, three months and ended up staying five or six. So they enjoy the work. We, they processed loan applications with us. They prepared credit assessments uh, and uh, prepared uh, loan agreements. Uh, they, they saw the entire process from loan origination uh, throughout loan enforcement. Uh, they visited projects. Uh, they saw an actual uh, production process. They particularly liked agricultural projects because who doesn't? In 2017, uh, we offered um, a development finance seminar at American University, which very successful, uh, 18 students, 50% uh, of them, them uh, women. At the end of the seminar, we took them to a feed, um, uh, to a feed mill a poultry uh, company, I should say, that we have been financing since 2008. Bell plans to continue these activities uh, in exactly the same way, the same type of company, the same sectors, the same range, with particular focus on agriculture. But before I get to that, Bell was named after Gertrude Bell, who everybody knows. Uh, we are about to um, launch another development finance seminar at American University, which will be announced very, very soon. It's more ambitious in scope and in length. Um, uh, 29 weeks in total. So hopefully you will see a press release from us in the very near future. These are uh, 15 projects that we financed over the years. It, it illustrates the proof of the pudding, as I call it. Uh, these photographs speak volumes uh, better than anything I can mumble about the things that we have done over the years. Uh, our borrowers' revenues, gross revenues, ranged from one and a half million dollars to 50. So it's a broad range of, of economic activity, of sophistication, um, commercial reach, uh, etc. We, since I joined MDEF in 2009, and we saw obviously how fragile Iraq is in general, just to illustrate the referendum a few years ago in Kurdistan, uh, reduced some, some of the, our borrowers revenues by 75%, because uh, it's, as, I, as we were saying the other day, uh, Kurdistan represents 15, 17% of the Iraqi economy, GDP. The big markets are, of course, south of Kirkuk. 
And after re the referendum, uh, accessing those uh, or retaining, actually keeping those markets was challenging at, at the very least. Um, this is what we have done uh, for 15 years. Uh, we intend to do the same thing, as I said. Uh, unfortunately, that leaves uh, outside um, uh, startups because of the high commercial risk involved in uh, financing or investing in startups. Um, we like to look at uh, EBITDA uh, and, and, and we like to say that uh, we uh, structure our loans, uh, the payment schedule and, and the length of the, the, the life of the, the tenor of the loan based on <clears throat> a monthly payment that represents about 50% of monthly EBITDA. Um, the, the margin for improvement, the margin for growth is, is simply immense. Uh, I always mention that uh, USDA, the US Agricultural Department in 2016 estimated that uh, Iraq produced uh, a total of 250,000 tons of corn. Uh, when the US, the largest producer, uh, harvested some 350 or so, uh, and uh, it was the number one producer, of course, 250,000 tons of corn in 100,000 hectares. One of the two numbers is wrong because the yield, if we accept both, the yield per hectare is, is very, very small. But nevertheless, uh, it illustrates uh, the tremendous upside. Since 2008, we have been financing a poultry company that owns a hatchery, a feed mill, a corn drying facility, and a slaughterhouse. The entire value chain, as the word these days goes. Um, thank you. If you could um, summarize now, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, that's it. We intend to do the same thing in agriculture. Uh, with agriculture, we intend to go for structured finance to mitigate uh, the risks. When we, we cannot finance uh, the, the harvest of agricultural commodities because of the high risk, but we can and we will finance the sources of demand for agricultural commodities. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, George. Um, and uh, just uh, moving on now, if we have Omar Dwekat. Uh, Jabbar, I know you're waiting patiently, um, uh, but your time will come. Uh, is Omar here? Is he available? Is he on, online? Omar from uh, Alvin Blanche. Can't seem to hear you. Okay. In which case, do we have John Taylor from Hydro C? Yes, uh, this is John, uh, John Taylor speaking. How are you? The, the field is yours. Tell us what you're doing. It's exciting because we've got a potato finale coming up. <laughs> well, we're keeping the best to the last, uh, actually. So, listen, first of all, thank you very much indeed for giving Hydro C the opportunity uh, to propose, uh, to listen, to help with the, uh, the various products and the industry in Iraq. It's been very interesting and informative uh, so far, and I would like to just add uh, a bit of uh, history about Hydro C. Hydro C are, are based in Scotland. Uh, the managing director of the company originally is from Iraq, and because of this, he's gained many, many years of experience within the private and the public sector. In the main, he has been involved in the oil and gas industry, but from a family history, agriculture uh, has been part and will be uh, continuing to be part of his uh, business. My uh, job, uh, in inverted commas, with Hydro C began about three years ago. Um, I'm uh, of an age where I could retire, but when I met Hassan, I was so impressed that when he asked me to help uh, develop uh, his business interests, initially in the oil and gas, I was only too happy to accept. Um, I uh, spent a lot of time abroad, uh, mainly again in the oil and gas industry throughout the world. And no matter which uh, product you're trying to supply and sell, the basics are always the same. 
Uh, you've got to have the quality, you've got to have the, serv uh, the service, and obviously you've got to have a price which is acceptable. Sometimes this price will be uh, perhaps a little more expensive, but the quality and the service are the two main things as far as I'm concerned. Uh, there is an old saying in Scotland here, if you buy cheap, you buy twice. Now, where do Hydro see and what do they want to achieve in the agricultural sector? We are looking for uh, an experienced uh, partner in Iraq, uh, exclusive partner, I might add, to uh, supply uh, potato seeds uh, from a company that has been uh, formed in Scotland with the history of Scotland with the agriculture and the farming, etc. And they are looking for Hydro C to um, act in their behalf uh, with a partner in Iraq. Communication is a huge thing. And one of the things that Hydro C are able to provide is that being the Iraqi history and background, there are people there on the ground floor who would be able to be um, asked, asked to visit, asked to propose, asked to whatever locally. So that is something that I find uh, of great interest, which would certainly help uh, speed up any issues. The import and export of products are very uh, difficult in some occasions and with the experience that Hassan has with that particular uh, segment of industry makes it a lot easier and a lot quicker. So, John, uh, I think you have some specific kind of potatoes that we're looking to hear about. I think they are drought resistant, am I right? Well, yeah, there are there are quite a number of uh, types of the, the seeds. Uh, for example, the French fry market their, their brands like Marvel and Valor, which has already been supplied into Iraq. For the, the crisping, I know them as chips. Uh, there's there's a, a variety of seeds there for that particular market and for the fresh market and the red market. So what I would like to do, if possible, Ash, is to uh, have a kind of a bespoke um, proposal for any interested part. And we would certainly come up with various uh, prints for the, the established varieties, for the new varieties, and just set it so it's a personal thing rather than, um, you know, a, a piece of paper. I want to make sure that people will have what it will be for them and so that they can make up their minds the way they want to go with us. So basically that's, that's what we're trying to do. Um, I would just... Because I've been in this particular industry for many, many years and hearing about the youth in Iraq, I would honestly pray and hope that they are given this opportunity. I got the opportunity many, many years ago. And that's why I'm trying to help people to not necessarily be financially successful millionaires, be happy. And I just want to put that across to everybody. I'm here to help and that's through Hydro C. So Thank you very much, John. I, I was talking to Hassan the other day and he said that uh, he particularly wanted to import some uh, very drought resistant potatoes. So I think going on to our next guest uh, is Jabba Ofnan, who is probably the leading potato production uh, farm in Iraq. And I understand Jabba that you have the state of the art uh, production techniques and uh, really have got something to show the world here. So may, may I pass on to you Jabba and look forward to what you have to tell us. First of all, thank you very much. Thank you, Ashley. And thanks for IBBC uh, to having us to discuss about uh, what we are doing here in KH Company. Uh, first of all, I do uh, just want to share my desktop here. Hi. Can you see it, please? Yes, thank you. Very okay. good. Okay. Uh, so, uh, KH Company is a uh, leading company, uh, and we have been established in uh, 2009, and uh, we are focusing on the uh, potato, uh, seed potato distribution, and our business uh, focus on the uh, potato uh, growing, potato uh, um, um, agriculture machinery supplying for the farmers, 
and we are um, growing by ourselves also uh, different kind of varieties for the in and for the table potato also we have uh, storage also uh, we have uh, um, uh, sorting and grading uh, uh, machinery also uh, factory in our uh, business line also uh, so uh, we are doing uh, uh, our, our main focus on the, on the potato and we have uh, uh, very uh, experienced people also in the past uh, 11, 12 years uh, in, in doing uh, this business. And uh, we are uh, uh, having a very uh, uh, sophisticated and advanced uh, training techniques for the farmers uh, in, the, in, in Iraq, in, in the south and, and middle and also in, in north of Iraq. We have uh, an exchange program, uh, exchange experiences program from uh, from from Europe to to uh, to Iraq, uh, and we are sending uh, uh, around 90 uh, farmers. Uh, among uh, those farmers who are using our products and services, and the uh, the uh, the the seed potato that we are distributing to them, we are the uh, exclusive distribution uh, uh, distributor for HZPC and State Holland. Uh, of whom are the leading uh, companies, if uh, John allowed me to, to describe them in this way. Uh, so uh, this is what we are doing here in, 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 in Kurdistan, especially specifically in, in uh, KH and uh, all of uh, uh, our farmers are, are, uh, have been grown with us in the past few years. So uh, uh, let me show you a couple of, of uh, figures here. And you can see that uh, we have increased the, uh, the seed potato uh, distribution uh, as long as with the, with the production. And you can see that uh, in the past few years, we have been uh, dramatically and exponentially increased the production for potato. And last year, we could reach uh, 450,000 ton of potato, uh, uh, specifically in north of Iraq. And uh, we have uh, hundreds of, of, of farmers uh, who have been distributed in, in uh, south of Baghdad, Yusfi, Latifia, Karbala, uh, Anbar, um, Kirkuk, Mosul, uh, uh, as well as uh, Diyala and from the north of Iraq, of course, we are talking about Suleimani, Duhok and Erbil, and specifically in Duhok governorate, we have huge amount of, of, of uh, farmlands whom are, uh, uh, and, and the farmers who have been uh, exponentially growth with us uh, and they could produce thousands of tons uh, uh, a year. So uh, as I had mentioned that uh, we, our distribution uh, has been uh, uh, dramatically and, and uh, exponentially grown in the past few years and uh, our varieties is, is uh, are one, one of the, the, the most successful one and uh, uh, they are very good for, for the nature and uh, climate and also the temperature of, of, of different places in Iraq. <clears throat> Sorry. So uh, um, some basic figures based on the uh, information that we have as uh, colleagues also mentioned that uh, we have around 20% of uh, Iraqi uh, lands are, are suitable for, for agriculture. And uh, uh, based on the, uh, uh, the, the figures, we are expecting that uh, uh, people will, will, will consume in, in, in a place like Iraq, in a country like Iraq, around 30 kilogram per person. So if we combine those information, we will have around 1.2 million uh, uh, ton requirement for, for, uh, for animal consumption for potato in Iraq. So uh, if you convert this one to, to to uh, other figures, you can see that there are more than $100 million uh, 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 revenue that are generated directly by, by the uh, potato production. If, uh, and also we have some other uh, requirements also uh, because we cannot, we have one, almost one season production, but we can do a dual season a, a year. Uh, we can do it in the, in the spring season and we can do it in the, uh, autumn season also, uh, and we have done some sort of, of uh, tests in the south of Iraq and also in, in, uh, in Mosul also. Uh, what, what we have done and uh, what are our objective uh, at KH is to minimize the gap between the, uh, the, the consumption and production. 
and also try to invest uh, uh, more in, in technology. And those machineries and techniques and, and, and uh, uh, experience exchange between, uh, between Iraqi farmers and uh, well farmers, especially in Netherlands, in Belgium, in Germany, uh, have been uh, uh, a very uh, important effect on the, on the, uh, on the production for, for, uh, for our farmers whom have been uh, at the beginning, they, they were just producing maybe a couple of tons or, or tens of tons, and now they are producing more than uh, 5,000. I'm talking about uh, one farmer can produce up to 5,000 to 8,000 tons uh, a year. So uh, they, this has been uh, done uh, with, with, uh, with uh, our partners, uh, especially in HGPC uh, from Netherlands and also from the uh, educational institutions in, in, in Netherlands and Belgium also. Uh, and uh, we do really thank them for all of this, uh, their efforts uh, that, that they, they, uh, they, uh, they provided to, to us. And uh, now we are in the, in the process of uh, increasing the, uh, uh, the amount of uh, processed uh, variety potatoes to, to uh, supply. Uh, like Lays in Soleimania and some other factories also who are producing uh, potato chips uh, in Iraq. And uh, we can see that even the French fries also is one of those uh, uh, potentials that uh, there are a couple of, of uh, uh, small companies who are trying to, to build factories. Uh, in our country, in our uh, company, uh, we started the, the project for building a uh, uh, three ton hour uh, uh, French fries uh, uh, factory. Hopefully it's going to be finished in 2022. So uh, these are the, the uh, main things that we are in it and we hopefully uh, will reach the uh, will reach the point that we can supply the actual demand for Iraqi uh, uh, country and uh, we can provide as much as possible uh, best quality of, of, of uh, potato, uh, for both uh, uh, processed and the, uh, the, the table potato also. So, thank you. Yama, thank you so much. That was absolutely brilliant. And I think might have surprised a lot of people that there is the capability, the expertise and the will in Iraq to deliver scale production. Um, may I ask you what you need next? Obviously you need technologies, but, but your ambitions obviously are to grow and to, to fulfill Iraq's potato. Would you go into other sectors? Do you want to collaborate with other areas, for example, with startup hubs? Are there, what are your ambitions here? Are you just focused on the business or how, how, how can this expand and, and influence everybody? Okay. Um, as you mentioned, and as most of the colleagues also mentioned, uh, that there are three main pillars to make a success for any strategic uh, business like agricultural development. It's about the, uh, the uh, partnership between public sector, private sector, and educational institutions. What we are lacking of is the research, okay, at the moment. And uh, it is very important that those uh, institutions, I'm talking about educational institutions, uh, in all, all the, the country to, to really involve in the, in the agribusiness development, okay, and doing research and supporting those businesses. This is one, one of the most important things to be uh, more competitive and, and to develop the agribusiness. Uh, the role of the, of the public sector uh, is to protect, at, at least at the beginning, for the, uh, for the uh, uh, you know, to, to let the, the farmers to be uh, able to sustain their, their, their businesses for longer time, uh, because at the moment, it's very hard for them to, to be very competitive compared to what we are getting from, uh, from different places. Uh, and uh, and uh, the, the role of the government is to protect these businesses and giving them the financial uh, support, giving them loans, giving them uh, uh, facility to exchange information uh, uh, and an expertise between what we are doing here in Iraq and the rest of the world. And I have been uh, impressed by, by uh, those gents from, from uh, UK firms who are doing uh, an amazing job and definitely I'm going to be uh, in touch with them later on. Uh, to discuss many, many ideas. We have done many things, but it was in, in a small scale because it's one company. 
it's it's very hard to one company can handle all of these uh, uh, developments altogether. But we need partners to 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 work with us, and we need investors like Mr. Ali Suhail and some other gents also whom are interested in doing doing uh, business with us. Thank you very much. That's very clear. So, in fact, actually, we were talking earlier about creating capacity for research in Iraq. That's obviously a strong thing for you. But also for the smaller farmers, they may, be, may need investment for someone like George or from Ali Sahail, uh, you know, to, to maybe capacitize what they've got. Is, is that what I'm hearing? Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Um, I think we may have one more, but I'm not sure he's on it. Is Mike Stannard here from WATR? Uh, I don't know whether you're here, Mike, or whether you want to present what it is, or maybe Tom Robertson, uh, Tom uh, Williams can, can present. Are you here? I think actually it's been a very long session um, and I'd probably like to thank all of you for all your contribution. Uh, it's from my mind, it's fantastic scope from the big organizations right down to Duha's startups. I think this is part of the ecology that I would encourage you all to work together, to touch base with each other, to share information. Um, come and do it through IBBC. I'm sure we can put people in touch with people. Uh, but I'd like to thank you all. I'd like to thank all our members, particularly who support us to do these things. Uh, we have members who are investors, members who are experts, you know, fertilizer creators, oil companies, right the way through engineers, a lot of Iraqi companies. Hopefully they are listening. They're interested in the agricultural sector to so put investment in, to provide support, to help the ecology that David and Eric are trying to create in the World Bank uh, and maybe bring you all together in some way. So I'd like to thank you all very much. Please get in touch with us if you need to ask for anything. I hope the presentations will be also available. We can share back with everybody who signed up and um, uh, wishing you all a very good evening. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, probably goodbye, I think. So thank you. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you.